Good evening, everybody. Welcome aboard the Wind Against Tide ship. We're stoked to have you here today. And we've come back after a long break where we've been fishing and holidaying and we've had uh, New Year's Eve, obviously, Christmas, a few fishing trips going on. How are you two boys faring? Yeah, not bad. You know, had to do the formalities for our Christmas break and... I think we're over that now and we're back into work. What about you, Joey? You still on holiday, chasing the tail? Yeah, no, I'm um, I'm uh, still a few days uh, just uh, working from home back back in the office uh, Monday. But uh, yeah, Adrian, hope you had a good uh, Christmas, Davey. Hope you boys are recharged and re-energized and ready to take on 2023. Yeah, well, bloody oath we are, Joe. It's, uh, it was a short break, but, um, you know, we had some nice... Nice weather without uh, being too boring talking about weather all the time, but uh, I really managed to crisp myself up nicely in the sun. Uh, my wife was very displeased with me coming home with crimson red skin, but it's just that that European complexion. You two are lucky. You, you're just a bunch of caramel caramello koalas. Yeah, it's a Mauritian genes, you know, isn't it? You know what, Dave? I actually put sunscreen on the other day and apply, reapplied twice in the day. Unheard As of. As you can see, I'm normal, no burnt skin. Absolutely unheard of because usually you just think that you're immune and you come back a little bit rosy-cheeked and you get in big trouble from your wife. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. you get in trouble too? Yeah. Oh, every now and then. Well, my wife was a skin uh, cancer nurse. So, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I used to get in trouble a lot. Um, you used to have to quickly put some moisturizer on at the end of the day to make it look like you'd put sunscreen on. Well, you know, guys, I just copied from my mum. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you are a mummy's boy. Get up yourself. <laughs> I have to uh, straight up dot myself in here. We did a pre-show check. Everyone's like, volume off on phones because Joe ruled the start last time. And I'm like, yep, volume off on my computer. Yep. Joe starts, my computer starts playing volume. So that's why he thought that start was a bit odd. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm tool of the week. I've given it to myself already. Yeah. It's all hey, right. We've recovered. Hey, guys, we've all been fishing here. Um, let's get this show on the road. Who wants to talk about their fishing trip first? Well, didn't, didn't you go whiting fishing, Joe? You actually took your boat out for the first time I since did. you've had the new motor on. And it only took four and a half months. So congrats, Joe, <laughs> taking your, your new motor out. Yeah, well, I don't know how six weeks went on to get to four and a half months, but thanks. I tell you what, it <laughs> seemed like six months. No, it did. There was a few good weather opportunities to get out. But anyways, we, we got the boat out on Western Port and we, we took it whiting fishing. And uh, yeah, my, my dad and I, a few days before Christmas, we had a fantastic session on the King George whiting. We were fishing in the cut in Western Port on the, at the end of the uh, outgoing tide. And, um, yeah, we found a nice little bank in the cut and we used uh, burley. My dad's got uh, some chook pellets with uh, tuna oil in, in, a, in a bag that he, he's got an old gym weight that he throws overboard that we, we got. An the, old gym weight. An old gym weight went in the bag, go, went over. <laughs> And, um, yeah, we were just plucking whiting off the back of the burley and we were using uh, bits of squid and just, just oh, sorry, Californian squid on long shank hooks. Beautiful. And that did the trick. And what did you catch, about a dozen whiting, we, we Chinese got, fish? Uh, we got 19 whiting. Very good, mate. But 19 whiting, um, you know, most of them are sort of, they were all different size classes. They were sort of just over limit to... A few ones up to forty, not like okay. not many ones like right into the forties that we that we normally love to see and get really excited for. But uh, yeah, just a just a general mixed size class. So now I tell you what, we actually when you actually went on this day, we actually didn't care what you caught. We all wanted to know how the motor went because we were like, this thing will either be too slow or it'll be perfect. And we kept giving you shit. Oh, you're not going to be able to. Going quicker than forty k an hour, and what, yeah. what was what was the prognosis? Was hey, it good? People yeah, want great. stats, Joey. No, yeah. no, great, um, great observation, Adrian. Like, look, the argument. So, my the hull of my Quintrex aluminium, it's it's a year uh, two thousand hull. So, you know, my argument back to the fellas was, it's not actually very heavy. So, um, it's only rated to forty horsepower, and uh, yeah, the good folk at JV Marine suggested 40 horsepower would be the maximum that we could go to. So we <laughs> attached, no, we attached it <laughs> that on. That was some good mass they did there. Um, the rating plate said 40. Sorry, Joey, 
you can only have 40. Well, yep. So 40 went on it. Um, and yeah, it went 40 kilometers an hour. Um, at, That's how at, it works. At, at full, it actually went 40 <laughs> kilometers an hour, believe Didn't it or you know not. That, the horsepower rating you buy is the top end speed you achieve. But then, you know, I was talking with Adrian when I got back and he was asking me about the ins and outs of the motor. And um, he asked me, well, did you have your motor trimmed up um, past past <laughs> zero? And Can look, you believe this, Dave? So well, I had to give I, him a driving I lesson. Was shocked <laughs> when he told me this. <laughs> well, no, I didn't. And I, I can't didn't. believe you're telling you're dobbing yourself in. No, I don't mind because there's a lot of people that have probably got boats listening to this that don't realise that if you trim up your motor more past zero degrees, which zero degrees like even flat with the water, <laughs> you, you can get some more top speed well, out of your boat. When, when you're on trim down, your boat sits like this, and as you trim it up, it keeps it more more flat and less um, motion on the prop because the prop's higher in the water column. So it gets to rev quicker, which means quicker top speed. Yeah, so what would you I call would have said it? it's actually the opposite. What do you mean? When you trim up, it raises the bow of the boat, less boat in the water, quicker top end speed. No, but have you ever known? Oh, it, I know what you're saying, but um, what I'm saying is the prop lifts up at the back yeah. and, it, and it creates you to skiff better. As yeah. it, if you got it down, you sit more. You're I basically guess, yeah. making less track. Trim in, nose yeah. goes in, a yeah. lot more drag through the water. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's lower top end speed. Yeah. Trim up, a lot less drag, quicker boat, but also a lot less uh, control. Yeah. So you don't have a lot of hull in the water. Absolutely. And that's why when you go up a hole on your motor, you get more revs because your motor's actually, your prop's actually higher in the water. So you can Everyone, gain maybe 400 RPM yeah. every hole you go up. So, um, so dead flat with the water, it, Flat out was uh, yeah, forty kilometers um, for for on a forty horsepower four stroke Mercury. We'll um, I'll get back to you. I'll raise the motor a little bit more next time, and uh, I'll get back to you on a new top speed. How fast does it go with a couple of hot chicks in it? Because I heard <laughs> <laughs> I heard you loaded her up. Now I, some... I was told there was some Brazilian babes hopping on this little tinny going to the pillars. A couple it... of busty Brazilians. Oh, right. That's they what I no, up, no, they, right. no, they were Colombians. Colombians. Oh, oh. oh. this is two lines more and more up. spiciest. You, you should have seen. Even just like when they talked, like I, straight away, I thought I was just out of Scarface in Miami cruising around the. The beaches of Miami. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Except in Miami, they'd be in like a 50-foot uh, cigarette speedboat. Hey, just remember that that famous meme that's gone around on the internet. Um, you know, remember uh, the, the guys that own the 50-foot the cigar boats and they're all like old guys and they're all yeah. <laughs> arms and arms. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. It's uh, the, the old fat guys with the hot girlfriends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm That's young. Like you, though, Joe. I'm young, and I've got a smaller boat. So you got, you got them. You're not compensating for anything, and you got them aboard because of your your own good looks. Not I reckon because it's because he slaps the base in his uh, nighttime gigs, and he's brought the uh, pussy along to the beach. Is that what happened? <laughs> pussy. Look, have, have you guys actually been jumping off those rocks at the pillars at Mount Martha? I Absolutely. have many, many moons ago. I never have. Like seriously, who needs the Amalfi Coast when you've got the Mount Martha rocks? It was beautiful. Um, like. On New Year's Day, it was it was a disgustingly hot, thirty eight degree beach day with no wind. Um, I had the four twenty dory out at the safety beach uh, beach spot. Um, my father was nice enough to get get to the ramp early in the morning. I, I was playing in the band the <laughs> night before, and Dad said to me, "Look, I'll I'll, I'll bring the boat out um, to the beach. We'll set up the cabana tent, and we'll have the the dory on the beach, so we can do some uh, beach cruising." So. The boat was uh, popped in and we got down to the beach about 11 o'clock and, yeah, um, yeah, my, uh, my two girlfriends, uh, Colombian <laughs> two girlfriends. Two girlfriends. Here uh, we well, go. They friend. My two Colombian girlfriends oh, came yeah. down from uh, Melbourne and um, there we had, you know, my family was having a beach day and we went for a cruise around to the Pillars and, yeah, once we got around that cove. You found at, an empty beach where you could just let loose. <laughs> There are a few uh, empty beaches on that uh, on that uh, on that uh, safety beach kind of cove, but yeah, we went around to the pillars and it was just like windless, and there were all these boats just crowded around the rocks, and our kids were like lined up, um, just taking turns of jumping off the off the main rock, which I'm going to say it's probably I don't know about a three and a half four meter drop, but. Um, I actually, I'd never jumped this rock before. Like that was always the goal. Like, look, the goal was to take my Colombian girlfriends out for a cruise, but the goal deep down inside was 
I'm going to go and jump off this rock. So you're a kid at heart. You're like, I want to jump four meters off this rock into the ocean. Yeah. So I had my trusty GoPro 11 and um, I said, I'm going to film myself <laughs> jump off the rock at the highest point of the Mount Martha Pillars. And uh, I think you've probably got the little 30 second clip sitting there. <laughs> How high up is it, Joe? <laughs> Man, it's, I reckon it's about three and a half, four meters. But when you get up there, it's bloody high. I was, I was shitting myself. <laughs> the thing is, Jay, I didn't actually get your clips. You cancelled it when you tried to send it to Oh, no. That's oh. all right. We can come back to that a bit later. But, yeah. But basically, you um, you jumped in with your GoPro and uh, I heard you had a bit of a mishap in front of well, all, the, you know, all the cool kids. You had to halt the procession of jumpers because you had a... You had a real stuff. I can imagine it was so elegant the way he jumped in the water that that's why he lost his cope. Oh, no, I, I totally embarrassed myself. So so all the kids are queued up, ready. Everyone's jumping off this big rock in, in Mount Martha. And well, I got to my turn and I'm, I'm filming myself and I had, I've come up, I've approached the cliff's edge and I've gone, hang on, fellas, I just need a second. And I, and I let a couple of other kids jump in front of me and then I said, okay, I'm going to give it a go now. <laughs> And I had um, my GoPro on a little clamp mechanism, similar we got here at the podcast. And um, yeah, I did the whole stick selfie and I jumped with my <laughs> arm held out. And the force of the jump was so great that the uh, the, the, ex- the bendy uh, clip arm, it totally yep. snapped off. My GoPro Hero 11's just gone all the way down to the sea floor, smashed into the sea floor. And then kids, naturally, there's a queue of jumpers behind me. They're all just bombing in the water after me. And I'm like, guys, guys, I've lost my camera. Stop jumping. <laughs> Stop jumping. So, I, you know, I, I had to power freestyle all the way back to the 420 Dory, which was anchored up into the nice shallow beach so the girls could get off the beach. So I power freestyled to the 420 Dory, grabbed my snorkel, praying that some smart-ass diver hasn't gone and picked up my GoPro Hero 11 um, while it was in the sea floor in front of the jumping rock and um, a power freestyle back with the snorkel and I collected my uh, GoPro, which was still running. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. the panic Joey stopped all these young kids and young girls trying to jump off the rocks here just for five minutes so he could find his GoPro. Yeah. I can imagine everyone was quite upset. No, no, they they were quite understanding. Yeah. I was um, so, yeah, but I reckon maybe we'll get that one up on the Instagram story a little bit later. Yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll I'll get share it. That we with you. We've described it so eloquently. I don't think we need to find that footage anymore. <laughs> uh, I think people are wondering if you made any other stop-offs. There's some uh, beaches along that coastline, uh, some nude beaches and whatnot. Did you uh, happen to pay any of those a visit, Joe? Um, I, I don't know what the name of them is, but there is... Oh, um, you know. No, I don't, <laughs> but I, I went into this little rocky beach in, you know, I'll call it Mount, the start of Mount Martha, and, um, yeah, I went for a little snorkel there amongst the broken ground. And, my goodness, I saw a huge school of uh, King George Whiting. They were, um, they were beautiful. Did you catch him? Which, Dave, you I told you about this and you mentioned there was some um, there's some other fantastic snorkeling down the peninsula. Yeah, there is. Um, some of the back beaches there off, uh, you know, between Flinders and the Shank. Apparently you jump in there. It's pretty lively. But uh, I've actually been in the water there at, nearby there at Mornington and um, not not in a marine park or anything because um, I was actually retrieving a drone that a friend of ours, whose name we won't mention, managed to crash into the water and I was searching around for that and I was amazed. The size of the um, abalone and, um, yeah, whiting and flatties and stuff in there. Port Phillip's quite lively, isn't it? It's quite Absolutely. A rich, quite it's, a rich ecosystem. You done much diving, snorkeling, Adrian? I used to do it off uh, Mount Eliza. I used to poach all the abalone there before fisheries got too keen on getting yeah. the uh, recreational anglers for doing that. Yeah, so. that's rude. <laughs> nah. Now I used to actually do a bit of abalone there, get my five a day in abalone season, and there's heaps of kinners there. And I used to do that with uh, the father-in-law, and but um, they've moved to New Zealand, so I don't do that as much anymore. Yeah, but yeah, yeah it's good fun. I noticed you had some real fancy uh, Christmas dishes involving urchin row and. Uh, Salmon row, just basically various fish, fish eggs. Yeah. Oh yeah. Let me set the scene with this. I was talking to Adrian close to uh, Christmas Eve, and he's basically described himself as the uh, 
He's a refrigerator mechanic and refrigerator mechanic, right? <laughs> All he's right, a fridge mechanic and he's and he's uh, basically he's, he's like he's like the Godfather, like Don Homer going to pick up all the the donuts. Adrian basically goes to his seafood dealers and pack, picks up his uh, favors from the year yes, in the that's form right. of uh, great tasty seafood. Well, what you, what you do, guys, um, when it, the lead up to Christmas, basically you you want to have a few fa- favors up your sleeve from a few butchers, a few fishmongers and, you know, a few various different bakeries. And when it comes to Christmas, you know, they owe you a couple of favours. So when they're quite busy around Christmas Eve, you just walk through the back door and you get lovely big hampers and, yeah, that's Christmas sorted um, this year. So, you know, I had quite a variety of things. Um, As Dave was saying... uh, You were basically flexing. Yeah. So this is uh, one of the dishes we made for Christmas. Um, It doesn't appetise Dave whatsoever. It looks like a tongue. Doesn't it? Well, that's, <laughs> it looks that's, like that's a, a bit of kinero, a bit of, bit of um, yeah, salmon eggs and some lobster. And it was absolutely a, delicious. Looks like a tongue hey, sticking uh, out of what, a roll. What's in the middle? Is that lobster like fried? No, no, that's kinna, sea urchin. Oh. Yeah, and it is one of the most delicious um, seafoods you can ever eat. Um, there you go. If you haven't tried it, you probably won't like it, but <laughs> I suggest you try it and then, then you will like it. So, yeah. I'll, I'll try what other delicacies, delicacies did you have? Because I, I was a bit jealous. You had your crayfish. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Did you get crayfish? Yeah, yeah crayfish that, rolls. Yeah, yeah, so I made, um, yeah, we made uh, crayfish rolls and they were absolutely insanely delicious. Like, right. I, I enjoyed Christmas. And, and I got a good big roll. Pataki 6.3 kilo ham and I managed to get that down to one and a half kilos within, you know, a week and a half and... Hang on, we don't need. I, the, I, I called it quits on that. We don't need the snapper police to <laughs> weigh your ham for verification. Do we? <laughs> no, well, you know, you know, five kilos in a week and a half is pretty good. <laughs> oh, speaking of snapper, I got stuck into some awesome snapper on Boxing Day. Yes, you were very pleased with yourself, Joe. Why don't you tell us about that one? Well, uh, I set out with um, when fishing with my uncle Tony on Boxing Day. Um, once again, back at uh, Safety Beach, I've got a lot of family with uh, homes at Safety Beach. So now, now J- before Joe goes on with the story, he was kind of panicking the night before. Um, Bad. Yeah, he's like, I need some marks of Port Phillip. <laughs> I haven't wet a line in yeah. Port Phillip all year. So I gave him a deep water mark off Mount Martha Mornington Way and. I'm not sure if you went to that, but that area normally produces this time of year. Yeah, Adrian, I absolutely went to that area yeah. and just like my... um. Oh, oh so it was Adrian's spot. <laughs> no, no, well, look, my, my fishing mind um just told me. <laughs> my fishing mind said... I didn't know you had one of those. Yeah, well, I got a fishing mind. <laughs> it's just said this time of year, predominantly... If you deep been, water. You go deep water towards yeah. the shipping channel and you can mark up fish and get them to go. So we went to your mark yeah. um, about... 21, 22 meters, something like that. And uh, look, we set out at dawn on Boxing Day. I was with Uncle Tony and my dad. We sounded around for about an hour and 15 looking for um, arches. <laughs> yeah. um, we've seen no arches scanning up and down the, the shipping channel. Sometimes it's hard to actually mark these in the mud, I've heard, because the mud kind of disguises them or something. Is okay. it, uh, That's what I've heard. Look, we, we had a Lawrence HDS five like you know it was still still a decent sounder like it wasn't ancient but nothing on the screen at this point in time uncle tone's ready to kill me he's like oh we've missed dawn we better start fishing he's getting really cranky with me so <laughs> I've, I've got out of panic i was driving the boat i've gone all right well we'll just go to the spoil grounds yeah um which oh the old the, the, old the spoil old... which is like a broken reefy bottom i'm gonna say i call this a panic anchor yeah, so the old panic anchor. So we've gone to the uh, the spoil grounds. Um, we've burlied the crap out of the area using a couple different methods. Um, don't know if you guys or people listening. There's this uh, red cylinder called. Shh, shh, shh. There's this red called cylinder the called secret. the. What's it called? The secret weapon. <laughs> the weapon. It's called the secret weapon. The weaponized burlier. Where you um, basically it's a capsule with with some weight in it. And you, you know, string it up with maybe some hundred or two hundred pound uh, mono, and you fill it up with your, your chopped cubes of uh, pilchard or or guts or whatever you want, and you send it. Once you've anchored, you it sends the burly straight <laughs> under your boat, and 
you yank on the string and the capture will just open up and the burly will actually stay all under your boat. So we did a few secret weapon burly bombs. Um, we got to the spoil ground, no archers on the sounder. And after half an hour, the first rod goes over and, yeah, we had our first snapper on board, which ended up being... <laughs> Tell you what, Joey, I've got a bit of footage of your... Uh... Oh. Of a your Uncle Tone in action. Let's roll the tape. He's, He's pretty a, excited. He loves that old Uncle Tone. Have we got any volume going there? Is um probably not. No. No. Here we go. Anyway, we've he, got Uncle Tone wanting a fish in. He's whining. Oh, I'd love to see it. He's the 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 look at that. He's like jig winding. The <laughs> line was just uh, squealing off that uh, rusted spool. <laughs> Went slack a few times there. Anyway. We're commentating because we've got no audio for some reason, but I'll skip ahead because here's the landing, Joey. Yep. Absolute beauty of a fish coming up from the depth. Here we go. We've got volume now. Joey's going nuts. He's calling this like a 20 pound the way he's going off here. Oh, I, I, man, they come up so big. Um, <laughs> those snapper, like it looked like it looked like about a six and a half, seven kilo fish, but it, it was only about four and a half, I'm going to say, but. <laughs> Um, no, beautiful snapper, but my uncle was so wrapped on it because um, I bought him one of those black magic uh, snapper snack things for, for Christmas, which is a, a plastic Lumo skirt on a... Um, yeah, it's just basically a fly and a hook. Yeah, on a, on a KL, KLT hook. And um, yeah, he just had a couple of half pilchards on the snapper snatcher and secret weapon, burlied the crap out of the area um, at, at the spoil grounds of Mount Martha and... We got four nice snapper up to 75 centimetres. And he went out the morning after and backed it up again with another four snapper, roughly about the same size. So there's a report for anyone holidaying down Safety Beach, Mount Martha, snapper at the spoil grounds. Absolutely. Check it out. And now that Joey's uh, ruined the secret of the secret weapon, we can just call it a weapon because he's let the secret out. No, it's a great thing. Like, uh, yeah, I, I wish, um, you know, we, we, we went on board with um, – uh, Webby out at uh, Lake's entrance. I think uh, a secret weapon might have been uh, could have been quite the weapon on uh, some snapper when we True. were with him on the Barracuda Man, barrels. Did go for a bit of a random drive and did a day trip down to Lakes, Joey. Four, <laughs> four hours, oh, three and a half hours. Each I actually way, thought casual. this was one of the gutsiest roles I've ever heard of. Adrian <laughs> didn't understand what we were doing. No, <laughs> it was a two week old report and you just delved into it and it was very gutsy. Oh, you, you know what? It was. A, it was actually a nice little trip, even though we um, we didn't achieve the goal. We knew that that was going to be, you know, low odds, although we were hopeful. Uh, why, why did we go there? You know why? Because I was thinking about it the night before and I thought, you know, sometimes you just got to do dumb stuff and hope it pans out. Yeah, absolutely. And it didn't this time. But anyway, <laughs> what happens is, and I can say this now because the fish are no longer there, but we've received some videos over uh, the last month or so of some very large tuna swimming around a certain oil rig out there off Lake's entrance. And you know what I'm like? Cannot resist big tuna reports. So <laughs> we couldn't get there at the time. Um, so we had reports confirmed about probably four weeks ago now um, that they were still there by one of the helicopter pilots that was flying over the region. So it wasn't... You know, they weren't too old, these sightings, Adrian. I know, but sometimes you can't trust people's reports. We've heard of um, people calling barrels and they're dolphins. Um, so how accurate can you call some random helicopter pilot's reports? Wow, well, I'll show you. I've actually got the footage. Oh, yeah. I can show you later there. Yeah, <laughs> but isn't that, bluefin. <laughs> isn't that uh, footage seven weeks old, not the latest two weeks oh, old Oh, yeah, one? there, was, there yeah. was footage of them taken yeah. from off this oil rig. Yeah. Of which I will Let's roll name. the tape. We're not rolling a tape. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, these, these are secret weapon tuna. Okay. <laughs> secret weapon tuna. <laughs> no, All right, no, cool. No. Some things you, you just don't you don't blow the whistle on, Joey. They're not oh, okay, our, sure. It's not our uh, it's not our report to publish, even though we are right now. But anyway. <laughs> so we went there and we went to this spot and um pretty quickly realized they weren't there. And we thought, oh crap. Just a <laughs> just a flimsy what 60, 70 K out. A four-hour drive, uh, long run in the boat, and um, that was it. Basically, day over. No, we we thought, you know, we got a we got a plan B. We didn't have 
the right tackle with us or anything, but we thought Simon's been catching some really nice snapper to 8.2 kilo in the last week or so there. He's caught centric. eight kilo snapper, has he? Multiples. Well done. That's a um, good fish. So me and Joe are like, take us to this spot. We <laughs> went there and I'm reliably told it's usually a first light bite there off Lakes Entrance and we'd, we'd miss that because we went off chasing unicorns. But um, nonetheless, we thought, you know, we're going to give that a crack. We're down here. So we we marked up some beautiful fish on the sounder, anchored on them, and there was like just barracuda everywhere. So we harvested a few of those. <laughs> yeah, on your uh, Tiagra 50. Yes, the old Tiagra 50. Uh, probably not the best. <laughs> the old offshore wahoo. You should have seen it. We had the the bent butt Tiagra and he put it like I put a Sabiki rig on his Tiagra 50 <laughs> and we were just jiggling up these barracuda like you wouldn't believe. Jiggling it up, eh? That's right, um, which uh, I then checked over that when I got home and there was just teeth marks all through my line. So I was like, oh, that's not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so we deployed some of them for bait and uh, we, Simon and Bailey, uh, Bailey's Simon's young fella, he's a really good kid. Anyway, they um, got some rods going and a couple of them actually did scream off. So we dropped one good fish. Then we managed one that was about two kilo, for, which for middle of the day, not a bad result. Oh, absolutely not. It and then it well. was uh, straight into the uh, and entrance. A, and a gummy. We, got a... we did get a few gummies, yeah. Yeah. We don't discuss hey, that. How, how was the uh, the bar rolling? Because there has been quite a lot of water, but the dead water's flat. dried up a bit now. So Yeah. No, the bar was absolutely dead flat. Low swell, yeah, just in time good. for holidays. Everyone was yeah. bloody. You know what lakes was like. Oh, it's yeah. Got to be one of the the busiest holiday destinations oh, in Victoria. Now it is, yeah. It's unbelievable. Apparently the uh, the bandwidth there can't even let text messages out in FaceTime because <laughs> there's that many people using the uh, internet there. Really? Yeah. Oh, And I've just got one one food tip off for that uh, trip. So, um, yeah, we've, we've done the day roll as, as Dave's... Uh, <laughs> as Dave's mentioned. So we've, you know, left Melbourne at 2.30 in the morning and, uh, yeah, then we've, we've, we've left the ramp at 5 o'clock and... Yeah, we we were hungry and we were going to stop off for some dinner somewhere and we were in the mood for a kebab. So we were calling our friends on the way home and asking about um, kebabs and I think there was supposed to be one in Tarragon, but um, yeah. Do, do you know what happened, Adrian? <laughs> <laughs> Joe. Don't even want to know what happened. When Joe's behind the wheel. Yes, Tarragon, <laughs> probably one of the biggest rural cities we've got. There's, there would be multiple kebabs. Shops there because that's what we felt like. Well, you tell me a Turkish person in Taralgan. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't think it was going to be that big of a chance. Oh, so it was, a pro- it was a proper like Turkish bread kebab thing, was it? Well, no. Or was it the the Afghan bread or whatever? Once once we were driving around to Taralgan and we were on the phone to a few friends. We were and- chatting to Jonah, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Oh. And so they- what would Jonah do? <laughs> kebabs in Nothing, but Joe's <laughs> brain could not focus on two things and he just panicked and drove out of the city. I'm like, you realize that was like the last stop on the way home. I'm like, ah, oh, frantically looking up other stops on the way home and Joe's come up with Warrigal. So <laughs> and was, I've, I've Googled the kebab shop of a lifetime. <laughs> it looked like a bloody a caravan that you stopped at, was it? Yeah, yeah the crapper the better. It was a, <laughs> the crapper the better. It was this caravan in Warrigal that was positioned at the front of an old second-hand car yard that Mate. was closed for the day. And, my <laughs> goodness, it had five stars on it Google. It looked like something where you'd order kakalash and crab juice from. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it looked like. Yeah. Anyways, we, we long story short, we, we ordered this kebab. It took a little while to get the food, but, my God, that was just the most uh, golden, crisp, chips that I'm sure they were fried in some kind of animal fat. They were salted appropriately. There was chips on my salt, I'll put it that way. <laughs> the meat was hot and fresh <laughs> yeah. and um, and the bread was hot and fresh and oh my god, the garlic and chili sauces were so flavoursome. We, we called it the kebab of life. You know kebab shops, if you go there and it looks like it's more than likely infested with cockroaches and rats, <laughs> yeah. that it's going to be good kebab. And yeah. if the service is really rude as well. That's what you're after. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that uh, little excursion cost us 40 minutes out of our cannonball run home and had us on a much later arrival back into Melbourne than what we initially anticipated. Yeah, I could imagine Joe would be going under the speed limit the whole way home, which would infuriate me. <laughs> oh, no, no. I was, I was going 
Yeah. No, I, was, <laughs> no, I wasn't under, but now yeah, there was a bit of uh, Dave's phone was connected to the Bluetooth and then it was taking oh, no. us back to the kebab shop. Yeah, the phone wanted to go back to the kebab shop. <laughs> Um, yeah, Anyways. so Joe <laughs> recommends a few people are also commenting saying that they think that kebab van's really good, Joe. So maybe it, you, you've stumbled upon a little gem there. No, it's famous. I've, I've told a few people about it and they said he's, he's good, the old royal kebab. So. told a few girls on Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> That's Joe's new pickup line. He's taking him to the kebab <laughs> shop in Morrigal for a first hot date. Well, it's, it's better, than, it's better than the lobster cave, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we saw your story at the lobster cave. Joe's living. Ended up with a song on on your land room floor. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, it's moving That's right along. Winning tied up late. Yeah. 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 Uncut. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was a good. I had a good trip anyway. I enjoyed riding Joe's little speedy car. I, I dr- had a bit of a drive of it. It's quite the rocket. The Tig. The Tig One R. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've done very well with that. Thank that you. car and the tinny with the forty horsepower Merc, and you're the you're the man now. <laughs> That's it. No, I'm I've, uh, yeah, really splashed out. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> here's to a good year. That's right, <laughs> Adrian. You went out fishing on the tuna. I want to hear did. about that. I did, but I think uh, Dave went the day before and outclassed me. Like, oh, I, I don't know. I could... no, no, did you go first? <laughs> no, no. I went on. I actually went on New Year's Day. Um, it was one of the like. Oh, I think, yeah, I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Dave, Dave went on New Year's Eve. Adrian got mega FOMO. What um, happened was, or yeah, do you want to tell the story? He's talking about Christmas Eve. Yeah. This was Christmas Eve. I'm talking about the New Year's Eve one where oh. you actually caught fish. Okay, but I want to go and take yeah. us right back. Yeah, yeah. So take, what take happened is, right <laughs> I want to take us right <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah, Before you hear this, I just want to set the scene. Summer bluefin are back. Basically find any white sandy beach in 18 to 20 metres along the coast and your chance at finding summer school tuna. <laughs> Away to you, Adrian. <laughs> Dave's going right back here. Yeah, I'm going right back. Because on, on Christmas Eve, um, he went out um, fishing with uh, Mitch and Joel Bramble. Myself, Mitch and Joel. Uh, but it was a real late one because Mitch had the kids. I was doing uh, – I actually came in here to post out a bunch of hoodies and shirts because the demand was great, boys. And we still got a few of them left, everyone. So if you want to get your hands on one, shoot us a message. And I think I went to the airport to pick up the in-laws from yep. New Zealand. Um, so nobody could really go till about 11 anyway. And it was bloody windy. But the options were whiting fishing or bluefin. Yeah. And Mitch, myself, and Joel were in my shed. Started loading up. Joe the was there, was he? Joel. Oh, Joel. Started loading up the whiting rods. And um, Mitch is like, nah, stuff it. Let's go on the bluefin. I'm like, my man. <laughs> so we ran down to Flinders and we launched. And, um, you know, we we bashed and tumbled our way down out down past Cape Shank. And immediately we came across a really unusual sight I've never seen out there before. It was a blue shark of about 40, 50 kilo. And it had probably 10 to 15 bluefin just swimming on its, on its uh, peck fins, like, yeah, you know, like our dolphins swimming. <laughs> yeah, you know they use the pressure wave off a boat. I, I've seen, I've seen this uh, footage that you're talking about, um, especially with uh, in New Zealand. Yeah. there's these giant stingrays swimming on the surface, and there's big kings just following it. Is this what happened with this blue shark? Yeah, so it had tuna all over it. We cast, and it was doing this for ages. So we followed that around and casted it a while. But um, as we know, with Melbourne bluefin, the short window of time that we managed to be out there because we had to be back in again for. Christmas Eve festivities, um, they weren't really switched on and feeding. So, but you know that was good to establish that they were in the area. Absolutely, good start. And um, it was very rough. And you got and I um, picked up the in-laws from the airport. That's right. And I got back, and Haley's like, "Oh, yeah, you, you should go fishing if you want." Classic. Like, you know what? I'm gonna do it. And I messaged Dave, and Dave's like, "Don't do it. It's rough as hell." And they're not feeding. Yeah, they're yeah. not feeding either. And. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave's gone in. They launch at Flinders, and I'm going out the western entrance. And it was wind against tide, and it was windy. And I got past um, kind of Cat Bay, and it just stood up like this. And I'm like, you know what? It's safer for me to keep going <laughs> past the nobbies and get out of this current than to turn back. Holy Thank God you're getting a bigger rat. boat. Yeah, <laughs> and um, th- it was actually quite scary. Like you could only go like maybe eleven knots without. We um, me and Mitch himself. were like, God, he's an idiot. What is he doing? Surely he's not going out there. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, 
message you to say to make sure you hadn't gone. You're like, I'm already out here. I'm like, <laughs> just oh, you back, idiot. I'm gonna backtrack for a sec. You know, in your tuna handbook, you know, one would think that the rough weather would send the tuna into a feeding frenzy. But these summer bluefin, they're just they're not behaving like your traditional uh, winter autumn. Uh, tuna like what are you guys thoughts well, on how these uh, summer flu- bluefin behave i think it happens all around the world with these inshore bluefin once they're inshore they become ridiculously hard to catch and the moment they're offshore it's as easy as just chucking anything in front of their head and they'll eat it what do you think d- the tuna's know. motivation for the inshore well i've noticed there's not heaps of bait around so i think a lot a lot of it is a migratory um swimming pattern that they do Obviously, they feed when they find the bait, but probably a lot of the time they're actually not really in a feeding mode. They're, they're just cruising through. On those nice, calm, hot days, you see them up on the surface because they're up regulating their body temperature and that sort of thing. And that's when they're probably easiest to spot, but notoriously hard to catch. Absolutely. They're a pelagic predator. Like, you know, they have to eat at some point, right? You know, they're not well, going to... They, they- uh, they actually are feeding when they're like this, yeah. but the the bait is about this big, which made me think like, about tiny. His uh, Dave talking about chasing around the blue shark, and, and you were talking about the stingrays. Like, yeah. look, are these tuna like are they leeching parasites? Are they following? Um, you know what I mean? Like, no, I don't small, think something it's that. Small. I think it's more they you that. They're very inquisitive creatures, so I think partially it's that, and also they're probably using old mate shark as a bit of cover, a bit of protection. Well, you, their you think sharks love rays? Like they'll they'll destroy the ray before they go for the kingfish. Um, oh yeah, that's probably yeah. a good theory. And they're probably just hiding behind this thing um, from predators. So. Look, yeah. here's my predictions, Joey. It will get a lot easier in the coming months, and I'll tell you why. Because the mutton birds will—they're already kind of here, but they'll be here in big numbers, and they'll start to feed on the same bait as the bluefin. Yeah, and once they do that. It makes it's like a big signpost in the sky, obviously. You're just looking for the millions of birds. But it also makes it the fish feed a little harder because the mutton birds are coming through, crashing the bait, splitting it up. And then the bluefin are becoming that feeding frenzy as well, because the bait's obviously scattered, vulnerable. It, it's like sign. its own little ecosystem. It is. Like the birds are shitting, it's feeding the white bait, <laughs> and they're all eating each other and and it just just keeps the frenzy going. Do you know what I love about the mutton birds when when the huge schools of mutton <laughs> birds come in and they they take off from the water and their little webby feet like and they've taken off it creates <laughs> like this a ripple so you'd think that the tuna yeah they're inquisitive they see the little mutton birds take off as well and they'll be coming up to have a look. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um and I've got a similar theory about sometimes I was saying this to someone the other day you think when you come up silently on a school of these rip, rippling tuna, as we like to call it, when they're sort of sunning themselves, you'd think you come up quietly on them and you cast the lure in. That's the most stealthy presentation and that's going to be your best method of capture. But we do this often. Some days it works. Some mm. days they just ignore the whatever you're casting in their popper, stick bait, soft plastic, whatever. And then you go, stuff this. I'm putting two divers out, a spread of bar out, whatever. I'm going, I'm just trolling past these or you're running them over and pushing them down basically basically yeah so my theory here is the prop what the boat comes through splits the school the prop wash confuses the fish they think this is a feeding frenzy happening they get into feeding mode there's crap going everywhere and they see the nearest bit of food and they nail it because that's exactly what happened to me and my brother tom yeah you went out on christmas eve that's right sorry new year's eve uh new New year's Year's eve Eve. yeah Yeah. new year's eve we we managed to go out. We got a leave pass from the families. Uh, oh, Joe was present for the negotiations on this one. Oh, the wife negotiating the night before was hilarious between Tom and his brother about how long they were allowed to go fishing for. But yeah, go on. <laughs> anyway, we secured a window of <laughs> between six a.m. and uh, what was it? Twelve p.m. Twelve p.m. <laughs> why? Why six a.m.? Why not four a.m.? Oh, because we wanted to sleep. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we we ran out there off um, out of New Haven and didn't take too long and we found a school of fish and um yeah we cast at them like i was just discussing and then eventually trolled through had a couple of hookups uh i did get a couple come up and eat the popper i was casting but um didn't stay connected and then uh the um alarm went off and it was scurry back into port time so we left them there and uh went home we had one we kept one fish how many we did let you one catch fish go. two just, yeah we just got a couple oh, yeah. um 
yeah, so we kept the one, let the other one go. We saw quite a few. Um, like it was pretty cool. We had them milling around under the boat. The water was super clear so yeah. we could see them swimming around. And uh, that was, you know, heaps of us for us to eat, the one that we kept. And, uh, you know, we went back in and we got some glorious fish and chips on the way through New Haven. Joey oh. would have appreciated this. Oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> San, Rima, San Rima, here's a tip for, here's a food tip for everyone. Normally Joe that gives these out, but if you call San Remo fish, Fisherman's Co-op on your way back through the entrance, the eastern entrance, by the time you get to the bridge, which is uh, the the jetty there, the San Remo, uh, your fish and chips are ready. And you just go pick them up and you carry on your way home. Stuff going out the western, I'm going to be out the eastern every Highlight time Highlight of now. the day, Joey. Highlight of the day. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? You can also call my mate um, Ben up from Saltwater. He's got a restaurant opposite San Remo and he does palmers and everything. So you can get a palmer palmers. on the way in. Oh, <sighs> options, options, options. That's just sensational. Ben <laughs> Dennis at Saltwater, New Haven. Pick up a quick takeaway on the way back in um, to Stony Point or Hastings at the Eastern. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I I actually went out the next day. I fell asleep about 10 o'clock on New Year's Eve and I woke up really early and I'm just like, nah, I'm going for it. I'm going fishing. I'm chasing these tuna reports that Dave caught. Um, so I literally launched, um, must have been like 450 or something. It was ridiculously early. Oh, wow. Look, have, have a look at this. This is Stony Point just cruising out, and that sun is that sunrise is just beaming over the horizon. Beautiful. That, and that there on the left hand side is where they got the fish and chips. Um, it's a beautiful area through there, isn't it? It's yeah, so nice. absolutely. Um, yeah, it's just and there's the oh. ri- there's the ripples that I found, and I tried to um, drive over them, and as you can see, the sound is lighting up. Oh, well, you've got that sound of pinging beautifully yeah, now. It's going yeah. good. It's like amazing. Picks up everything. 10, 16 a.m. There you go. Well, that was, yeah, I was with him probably since 8 a.m. that morning and I stayed with him to 6.30 that night Just, and, and I got one little bite at about 7.50 in the morning, um, pulled the hooks in the holder after about 10 seconds of, you know, screaming in the holder and that's all I got and it was ridiculous. You we, know what? I'm calling that as a giant barrel. Yeah, well, a big well, hundred kilo one, and you it, know it was what? kind of a blind strike. So, well, we got a little bite as well after I got uh, the salsa music going on the boat. Um, Same yeah. area, actually. Yep. Joe, and, Joe wants to bring up his salsa music. Oh, does no, he? No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you you know why I say that you you possibly could have dropped a big one there? Huh. because you were going right through a zone that our good friend Sasha Sergio yeah had gone through the day before, and he had um. Same lure you had out, the uh, old Helco King Brown. Yeah. And he went over a little bit of... Um, no, he caught it that day, that morning I was yeah, out. Yeah, the morning you yeah. were out, yeah. And I didn't even see him. And I must have... He was done and dusted, mate. He was back in there with his giant bluefin. Uh, that's what I'm confused about because uh, I was out like did he literally... Get... I was out at tuna fishing at 6.30 in the morning. He must have been out there super, super early. Uh, but did he get fish and chips on the way in? <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> no, and, too busy with his big lump of... And, Flesh. And literally, <laughs> I had been like trying to get these fish feeding all day, and then mate Joel Bramble comes out, and it, it, there he is. There, Tinny Gang. We got the little renegade gang gang happening there, and um, he he comes out and he tries his luck, and he's not he's not getting anything. And then we actually lost the schools. Um, so what I had to do was um, I had to put my drone up in the sky to find the school so as you can see there's a school there a school what? there and a school there that's cheating and and there's there's joel there he's a little speckle and he called me up he goes oh i found a school i go there's actually three schools there and he goes oh really clever. i can see two so yeah we worked those schools um for about five hours and eventually joel managed to get one on the uh the queen popper in um red bait color ah and and there, there he is there. Yeah, um, the old Mariah Pop Queen. Yep, absolutely. Well, we're loving that Mariah Carey remix at the minute on the boat. <laughs> the, Mar- the Mariah Carey? <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. It's news to me. Yeah. Uh, the, he's talking about Miley Cyrus. No, no, no. I'm talking about Big Big Energy. Oh, the, Big the, Big the Energy. Mariah oh. Carey remix. We're loving that yeah. at the minute. Sorry, that, that Pop and Mariah. <laughs> Just, yeah. yeah Joe's, so, Joe's brain goes to music. Yeah, so before Joel actually got out there... Um, I was kind of working with Lockie O'Reilly out there, um, trying to find the schools and, you know, bouncing off each other. And he goes, oh, these things aren't biting. I'm going back to Inverloch. 
And just after Cape Patterson, there's a marine park. And right on the edge of the marine park, he found him everywhere. You reckon it was right on the edge? No, it was. Because then he accidentally entered <laughs> said marine park? <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Because I actually went there after he landed a couple. He goes, oh, they're, they're feeding, but I've got to keep going in because I think dad, I think his dad wanted to go in or whatever. Anyway, yeah. he landed him and he calls me up and goes, oh, I found this weird thing in my tuna. I go, what do you mean? Oh, so don't tell me. Th- there's a picture there. And in the belly, you can see this little um, antenna sticking out. Oh. Um, and anyway, so I go, and then he sends it, he pulls it out because he guts it and whatever. And here it is here. It's an archival tag. Now, these are pretty rare tags to actually, because they don't deploy too many in uh, southern bluefin tuna. So what these tags do, they actually um, measure the depth, light, temp, and um, when this info is all combined, they're, a- they're able to, you know, um, model where this um, fish has been off that data. So how how are they receiving the signal? They have to have like a receiver somewhere. No, no, they? it's it's not. No, they need to actually recapture this fish to to um, oh, get the data. It's not a it's not a pinging one. That seems low. Yeah, odds. yeah, it absolutely is. That's why it makes this very special because it's not a satellite pinging one that pops off it's one that yeah actually had to recapture i'm sure he kept the fish Sorry. frame to get all the information out of it because he knows <laughs> how to do that well he actually called me as soon as he caught it and i'm like oh i'll make some phone calls or whatever and after the last encounter we had with a special tag you'd think he'd you know would have listened to the process you gotta have the head and the yep. frame and the gonads and whatever and um anyway i just kind of jonah goes because i messaged it to jonah and Jonah goes, oh, has he got all the frame in head? I go, yeah, I see him so. Anyway, I messaged him an hour <laughs> later. I go, oh, you got the head and frame, et cetera, and everything. And he goes, oh, no, was I supposed to keep that? I go, oh, yeah, that's a big part of what yeah. you want because you need the odor leaves to, to match up the data because obviously they've got chemical elements that have different elements in each ocean, so they'll be able to match that up with – the yep. light temperature so data and is, everything. Is the tag of, of any value without the No, it, body? it absolutely is because yep. this will tell. I don't know when this tag was, but I think it's a Japanese tag and uh, a Japanese science vessel tagged it in maybe WA. What's the, what's the status of the tag right now? Well, we don't know yet. We're trying to find the scientists who actually tagged the fish. Mm-hmm. Um and this isn't like one of those Japanese whaling scientific no, no, scientific they... <laughs> vessels, is it? <laughs> no, it's actually a, it's actually more of a uh, numbers game. They like to you know, see data on on fish and whatever. And I think they only deploy so many of these every every year. They do this um, voyage off the west coast of Australia. Yep. But um, yeah, we're we're still yet to track down the scientists who actually tag this fish. But um, the CSIRO have been in contact with. Lockie. So we'll find out soon enough. Um, because obviously the CSIRO's a Commonwealth um, you know, initiative um for this for these tags. So they'll know all the world um companies that do this. So yep. hopefully watch, we watch find your space. Out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we sort of brushed over it before, but it, we've got a King Kong Donkey Kong for this week, Adrian. We do, we do. So that <laughs> that um morning was um was sad. Yeah. King Kong, Donkey Kong. Do you have a picture of the fish, Dave? I do. There he is. Oh, I've never seen this photo. Look at that. So, Holy moly. Sash uh, and his mate, Sean, uh, they were going to go. They wanted to chase the school tuna. I assume the young boys were hungover. They'd been partying all night, and the dads just decided they'd go out and show the young bucks how it works. <laughs> now, now I, I believe Sash has never actually gone out the Ascensions to go for tuna. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think most of Sash mostly goes down to Port Ferry and whatnot, and and he, go, he does he whiting fishing the, out of Western Port. And does, <laughs> it. So he thought he'd have a local crack at the tuna, and he called me because me and Tom had got the fish the day before, and he goes, "Oh yeah, um, like you know what area were you at?" Because we were t- tossing up between going, you know, at the western entrance or um, Bow and Heads. I said, "Oh yeah." No, there was a fa- fair few fish there. Like it wasn't crazy good. Bow and Heads is that where he went? Not this time. Oh, no. not this time. No, he was talking about going that way. Yeah. Um, Maybe that bar crusher um, threw him off it. Yeah. Because there was we, a big bar crusher that just rolled in the bar. Yeah, we I might talk that about thing. that a little bit. Oh, I've stolen my segment. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> talk, bring it up. Yeah. Um, you may as well bring it up now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can go there. Yeah. There it is. 
Wow, yeah. there is a bar crusher just absolutely ripped open like a tin yeah, can. Six, that's a 670. That's a big boat. Yeah, that's someone's pride and joy right there. Just 670, 670 bar crusher absolute in pieces on the beach of Barwon. They've, they've misread the uh, bar crossing there in uh, Kama Crocker. Well, uh, well you've, you've actually got – it's a real thin line that you've got to follow there. And if you don't follow the right lines, it becomes quite shallow. Well, you've been out of Barwon yeah, Heads. Yeah, I have. And uh, tell us about it. Well, the first thing I did was – Made some phone calls before I went out of there to ask people what the line's like. And they told me, oh, don't look at the map because it, the sand moves, obviously. you got to stick more to this certain area. So I trusted their advice and now I've got marks on my GPS that I'll follow. Probably helps your boat draws about one millimetre of water anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, so four people were saved after a boat overturned on the Ballerine Peninsula uh, about 8.15am on Tuesday morning, which I believe uh, was the 27th. Um, so, yeah, the police responded. They were all rescued as part of a multi-agency uh, response. Two people were treated at the scene for minor injuries and um, incident not treated as suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't see why it would be suspicious. Well, insurance <laughs> job um, is oh, probably right. the suspicion. Well, but, that's um, really going all in if that's the case. <laughs> yeah. Rising interest rates, you know, yeah. boat repayments. <laughs> yeah, they'll get more gone. than uh, what the market value is. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it would be easier to, you know, put a little hole somewhere in the boat and oh. you're gonna go out and flip it over while you're still in it. <laughs> oh, who knows? No, but seriously, it's, it's, it's um, no good for those blokes. No, and, um, awful. Hopefully they're all right and... You know, boats are, at the end of the day, boats are just things and lives are much more important. Yeah, absolutely. Back to my sash story on this uh, barrel. Yeah. So anyway, he, Local summer barrel. So I gave him the area, the spot where me and Tom got him and he's gone yep. out that way and he goes, because he, he called me. Um, first thing in the morning, right, I get a picture of a tuna on the on the deck of his boat and uh, I don't have it up. <laughs> I don't know what Joe's playing. I don't know. He's laughing. Um, no, no, it's like Adrian's had the drone picture of the spot <laughs> that you sent Sasha to. Oh, right. Um, yeah, first thing in the morning, he I get a message from him and there's a tuna on the deck of the boat and I quickly looked at it. I'm like, oh, he got one. Then I looked at it again. I'm like, it's that that's like from one side of his boat to the other. What's going on there? And I sent him a message and it said, is that big? And he goes... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I believe he told you he caught it on a brown snake. <laughs> <laughs> he got, he caught snake. it on a brown snake, a Hulk King brown. So yeah. he went out to where me and Tom had the fish, didn't see anything. So he pressed on around a little bit further, didn't see anything still, completely dead. He's doing a classic death spiral and on his way back towards where me and Tom caught the fish and just blind trolling and bang, a rod goes off. <laughs> yeah. So he reckons they thought it may have been a he mako shark. He wanted to give up, didn't he? He thought they thought it may have been a mako shark. He reckons it actually jumped, um, and like literally, we we're in like twenty five meters. It jumped straight yeah. off the surf beach here. Yeah, apparently it jumped on the bite. Um, and an hour later, he had it nearly up. He's on a, a spin outfit. Was it ten thousand goser? It was like a Daiwa. I don't really know how the sizing works, but sort of equivalent to a twenty five thousand. Okay, was, oh, big, was it a dog fight? Thing, big was school. It? So. Pretty cal- capable gear. Yeah. Yep. Um, so he reckons about an hour in a seal started chasing the thing around. And oh. He thought, oh, we're done now. Um, and anyway, that may have helped him out because the seals probably tired the fish out a bit more and they get it up and, you know, the rest is history. His first barrel, he's done it out the eastern entrance and he's done it on New Year's Day. It, I can't believe yeah. that. King but- <laughs> Kong, Donkey Kong. <laughs> Can you believe like barrels locally in T-shirts and singlets. All right, just your casual roll out there, blind strike on the old brown snake, and away you go. We're usually covered to <laughs> head to toe in clothing. I've got my gloves on, and and that's when we usually catch barrels. So that's pretty special. And he's gone in to celebrate, and Adrian still out there casting his little heart out. Hey, I went through every lure in my tackle box and still could. I only got that one blind strike in the morning. That's right. That could have been my barrel. So I got my barrel. You never know. <laughs> and um, yeah, anyway, I was having family that day, that day, but I went back out the next day and uh, the weather was pretty severe, I'll tell you. Um, it was supposed to be, you know, not too bad. Thunderstorms forecast. I thought, oh, thunderstorms, there could be a bit of wind around with that. Oh, we thought we were budget. I was on board with you, Dave, and we were budgeting, okay, we'll probably get half a day's of fishing in. Yep. Uh, we got yep. no, well, we went out, but really we should have had no days of fishing because we, 
we we went down. We you know got pretty pummeled. It was very windy. Um, wasn't really from the direction it was supposed to be, and uh, the fish had like from Adrian seeing schools everywhere. We didn't see a. Single oh look, school. I was with like dozens of schools all day long, and literally it was like. Yeah. One in a million cars got a fish. That's right. Well, and we, Joel Bramble got that one in a million cars. <laughs> Thanks, Joel, for stealing my fish. Nah. He just outfished you, I think. Yeah, he did. We didn't even get to he see did. the fish up on this day. It was just too rough. Yeah. Um. So, you know, we gutsed it out till about 1 p.m. My brother actually came out, both my brothers, in their um, – it was Joe's birthday, by the way. Happy birthday, Joe. Oh, happy birthday, Joe. Yeah, on yeah this thanks, day. fellas. So yeah. Joe had a good birthday getting bashed around by the ocean. Yeah. Um. We got a beer for him on the way in, so, you know, there's always that. And we did. Um, yeah. So my brother flowed me out in his Webster Twin Fisher and I thought, you know. That's Isn't that the world's best fishing boat? Damn good boat. There's a video <laughs> of that on our YouTube if you want to watch it. Um, I thought, you know, that's pretty gutsy. He was out there most of the day as well. And um, anyway, we found out when he got back to the ramp, if you go over to my computer, we've suffered some damage on the old Webster. Holy crap. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Perfect that's like a runoff. Boat. The perfect fishing boat has a perfect crack in it. Where is this? Is this like <laughs> on the hull, like outside? Yeah, on the in on the inside of one of the um one of the hulls, one of the sponsons or whatever they're called. Is that aluminium? That's like or a fiberglass? ride. Off. That's like a ride off. It's aluminium. Kind of thing. So we, uh, we got to get on to your mate Steve. Yeah, he's got to weld that up for us. I, <laughs> I think he's going to have to cut that whole hull off and put a new hull on. Well, he's it. got two hulls. Yeah, you can just cut cut one off. Exactly. Um, Make it a single fisher. But yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it goes to show you, you know, the amount of pressure these boats are under when you're out there in that sort of those sort of seas. It, it genuinely will break a boat. Absolutely. So yeah, sorry, sorry about that, Tom. Very unlucky on your <laughs> behalf, but. That was no tuna that day, and that was, um, you know, our most recent tuna trip. But we did do one other trip, Joe. I'm going to let you take this one away because it's right in your wheelhouse. Well, uh, listeners, the day <laughs> finally arrived. Dave Standing has retired, sorry, has come out of retirement uh, back to whiting fishing. We finally got him back whiting fishing. Yes, and it was my <laughs> idea. Yes. Uh, no, we had a little um, Friday afternoon quick fish out on the whiting. Uh, my little boy Sam and my wife came and Joe. And uh, you know what? Don't tell anyone this, but I had the time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> he actually did. Um, yeah, Dave had his noodly um, whiting rods. That's right. I've got a, a set of $5. A parabolic whiting rods. I've got a set of $5 noodle whiting rods I've got. They're just you know, old school fiberglass, they bend like basically like the ugly stick right around on themselves. Yeah, and we'd anchored up. David captained us onto this spot where um, there was definitely a lot of toadfish there. I, I had a name for <laughs> toad it. Toadfish. I, I was calling this spot Jiggleman's Pit <laughs> because it seemed to be some like sand pit that was full of toads and whiting, but we just had to get through the toads to, to, to get to the, the whiting. And um, yeah, yeah, Dave. Yeah, the listeners want to know, was there a quad stack on the bait board? No, um, we've been talking so, about hey, this. That is unfortunate because you had your one chance to do this. No, I oh, know we're going again. We're into it. Now. <laughs> oh yeah, we. <We're... laughs> no, well, we had a talk about this, and we thought, whiting fishing, eh? You can't get a good photo of a whiting. That's why people have to pile them up to be to make people impressed that they've caught you know their bag of whiting. Well, you know what? I saw an impressive photo of a. KGW out of Portland today, 60 centimetres. That's true. Now, that is an impressive If you're catching them that big, whiting. it's all right. Well, I, but it got me and Joe thinking. We thought, you know what? Marlin fishing. People catch marlin. You know, they don't get a photo of it because they've tagged it and let it go or whatever. <laughs> what do they do? They raise the marlin flag. Whiting fishing. Joe's decided we're getting like 100 tiny whiting flags made up. <laughs> And we're going to hoist flags. And, and we're going to need probably four to five flagpoles that we can um, <laughs> clamp onto various steel bars of the boat. That's um, ridiculous. Yeah. You know you know what the whiting fishermen used to do? They used to get um, a like a, a string and poke it through all their eyes so they could hold them all up at once. Yeah. I don't no, know if the charter operators still do that, but that's oh, what that, they used to do. those days, Adrian. Although yeah. some people probably Oh, the skewer. Do. Yeah, yeah, the, the skewer or the string. Do you yeah. ever, have you ever seen like the Florida charters where they go for the bottom fish and they have a board at the uh, ramp yeah. where they nail With all the nails. fish to? Oh, <laughs> I haven't and seen that. And they have that. a nail board. Um, they nail like 20, 30 fish along this board and go, we did well, fellas. It's cringy, man, because <laughs> I was actually talking about this the other day. Yeah. Um, 
our mate Brendan's Dan Cutchins a big croc flathead. Have we got photos of that? Because they're impressive fish. Uh, yeah, I'll find the one his boy. son got, um, Finn Wing, uh, I think it was 89 centimeters. And this, and Brendan got a 93. Oh, have a look at there that. Brendan got a 93 centimeter fish too. Look at this. This one went 80, was it 89? Yeah, it? I think. Yeah. No, um, 91 centimeters, that one. I think on live mullet or something. Those well, yeah. Live mullet at night. Yep, they caught Lake, their own live mullet. Lake tires. They've been yeah. fishing there like zombies for like two weeks now, by the way. <laughs> zombies? Oh, he's been fishing like a psychopath, but you know, when he locks into something, he, uh, yeah. You got to jump on the U Fish Instagram today because Brendan put a video up and he he was red eyed and you could tell <laughs> he hasn't been sleeping. <laughs> Maybe he was on the hooch. Oh, he might have been. Hey, Joey, be this is the whiting I was talking about. Have a look at this thing 60 centimeters and it went 1.2 kilo. This thing is huge. Well, yeah. That is bloody awesome. And look, you know, the whiting down there, they've sort of um, they've sort of got a bit of a blue tinge to it, blue and white uh, tinge to it. They're, they're very clean, oceanic uh, Well, that's whiting. where the whiting come from, don't they? Offshore and they come in the, the estuaries and bays to spawn and get yeah. big. And... I, I don't know if you caught, you boys caught it this afternoon. Uh, Anchors Away caught uh, just over a kilo whiting. Um, this afternoon, in fact. So out of Western Port. Out of Western Port. Wow. Yep. Not so bad. guys, it's kilo whiting season. I've declared it open. There you um, go. It's the, kilo whiting season, Dave. That's an exciting prospect. I, th- I think there's some <laughs> big dogs to be had, Joe. And I'm very excited to uh, get into it. Um, the reason I I briefly brought up those flathead was I don't know if you guys remember back in the day. Do you remember the old flathead trees? You'd go to a yeah. like a like a flathead dis- fishing destination and these days you got a facebook wall back then you had a flathead tree right so <laughs> flathead people would tree. catch these big breeders and keep them and they'd nail the skull to a tree <laughs> now, to show off to everyone now unfortunately i think dave sent the wrong photo of finn that was a smaller model oh I'm, was it yeah i've got to i've got to come up with the big one cuz you reckon yeah i don't think so that's okay i think that was the right one well, reckon, I'm gonna I'm gonna find it anyway. Has someone um, sent you a bigger well, one of it? Well, no, no, um, because I I thought that one looked quite small. Um, here's the here's the actual one. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes, the other one looked <laughs> penisy. This is the actual 89 or 93 centimeter one. It's probably the same fish. One's just held out more. No, because I, no, I was looking different at the clothes. fingers on the uh, <laughs> yeah, different clothes and everything. So there you go. Well done, young boy, young small boy. You've done very well. He so, he did. Yeah, we, me and Joe, in summation, me and Joe went whiting fishing. Qu- quite enjoyable. Yeah. Got quite a few. We were supposed to be out there for an hour and a half. By the time, like, by the time we'd finished, I think it was 10 or 10.30, um, little Sammy, my not quite one-year-old, was an absolute champion and was out there the whole time with us and obviously his mum. And uh, we got back in and we absolutely hooked up a real late-night feast, didn't we, Joe? Oh, we did. Um, yeah, um, Maddie had organised a beautiful barbecue for us. We had a satay. Satay. Uh, satay. I was, was going to say satay. But... Sorry, sa- satay. <laughs> satay. Satay. Um, chicken kebabs, and uh, we had spicy chicken kebabs and sausages, and we had some lovely fresh bread from the local sellers at Crib Point with uh, all the sauces you could think of. <laughs> we really. We, so you had a midnight feast, basically. Well, look, we, you know, whiting fishing so busy, you can't really stop no. to actually have something to eat. Like oh. we were just literally flat out, you know, pulling these jiggling rods. For, <laughs> jiggling rods. They were jiggling and all uh, afternoon, and we you must just, have been jiggling other rods this summer. He was pulling a few rods. Yeah, we <laughs> forgot. We forgot to Dave. eat. We forgot to eat. So by the time we got back in, um, wow, well, we just absolutely yeah um, feasted up on this uh, barbecue. Oh, very good. It was, it was very, nice. It was very good. Uh, so summer. Summer means one thing. Or it means many things. good fishing. <laughs> it, it does. It means kingfish. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a really cool catcher involving one of our mates, um, Jason Taylor, recently. Really? Um, you know, he was big on tagging kingfish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's actually had the same... He has been involved with two other anglers. The same kingfish has been captured three times. Okay. Um, so one was by Kevin and Jace. Is that you, the one? Uh, I'll, I'll read the little extract here if you go up onto the yep. uh, New South Wales DPI fisheries page. So a kingfish ri- originally tagged in Victoria has recently been recaptured for the second time. 
keen spear fisherman Giovanni. Oh no, it's got speared. Yeah, so it's um long not getting, the king. Not getting recaptured again. Uh, he measured the fish at 117 centimeters and 14 kilo. So the fish was originally released on the 10th of January, January 2022, off Port Welshpool. The fish was released by Connor Hall, who was fishing with. It's one of Jason's proteges. Yep. Jason Taylor aboard his boat Matrix. Connor and Jason measured the fish to be 105 kilo, uh, 105 kilo, 105 centimeters. Only six days later. The fish was caught again by Ben Kirkham, who was fishing in the same area where it was originally released. He also measured it at 105 centimetres. Oh, there could have been some serious, um, yeah, punch-ons if they said they're wrong. There was discrepancies. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, they must have caught each other and got their yeah. story straight. Hey, hey, was it 105 or 108? Hey, you know that uh, 80 centimetre king I got? Uh, <laughs> need, we both need to. We both need to write down 105 centimetres, yeah. right? Uh, so it was recaptured only after only six days. So the fish was caught for the third time. It's, it had spent 309 days at Liberty and was caught more than 385 nautical miles from its original release location. That's crazy. Absolutely so crazy. It went on a big old swim. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But just that's, that's insane. So yeah. the king's now dead. It can no longer get <laughs> recaptured. Long Your days of being recaptured are, uh, are over. Fool me. Fool you three times. <laughs> yeah. Shame on you, kingfish. Let's just spear it. Get yeah. it done with. I think that's just the easiest way to catch them, isn't it? Same yeah. with those tuna. Yeah. They're not going to cooperate. Just stab them with a spear. I've got to tell you a funny story with the tuna as well. When I was out there, um, there's kind of a few boats looking for them. This before they came up to the surface. And there's kind of four or five boats around me. And I'm like, oh, that coffee's really getting to me. I'm going to go, oh, no. I'm gonna go in a bit shallower so I can get away from these boats and, you know, hang over the side. Number, you had number twos brewing. Yeah, yeah. So I okay. started, you know, went in, started letting loose over the side, <laughs> and, and these and these two two boats just come because I'm stopped. Obviously, they <laughs> they think I'm hooked up, and there's just steamed over, and I'm like, holy shit! I <laughs> need to get this. Yeah, I need to get this thing out quick. They think I've got fish here. And I've just like few brown mullet getting oh, released yeah. over there. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, you know, some tips. Don't go away from boats and stop your boat um, to do a shit because, yeah, other tuna fishermen will follow. No, well, that's what you get for following another boat. Yeah, absolutely. A bit of a poo trail going on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, yep. Good lowbrow story there, Adrian. <laughs> yeah. Joey, people want to know about the weather. Can you get your friend uh, Joe Bun on? Well, let's, let's strike, get, let's strike her up. Joe Bun on the show for us. I've even got the uh, weather forecast zoomed in for you, Joe. All right, fishing friends, we're quoting the weather uh, brought to you by seabreeze.com.au. Which has been incredibly <laughs> inaccurate lately, by the way. It has been in- ac- inaccurate, but you've got uh, from Friday the 6th of January, we've got uh, southeasterly winds in the morning uh, to 15 knots, uh, increasing to 30 knots in the afternoon and evening. Saturday is much the same like Friday, uh, 20 to 30 knots east, south, easterly. Uh, Sunday, <laughs> uh, actually looking like it's going to be quite a nice beach day again. Um, it but, looks like it's windy on Sunday. Yeah, it's looking like as well. As, um, I thought it was supposed to be flat. That doesn't know, look good. East, You're busy Sunday, Joe. We've got a first birthday party. East, northeast, um, <laughs> you know, looks like again 20 knots. And then Monday, it's, it's dropping right out um, to less than 10 knots in the middle of the day and increasing to uh, 10 to 15 Monday afternoon, the 9th. A lot of people probably going back to work on the 9th. So. What, what fishing options are you presenting to people in this period of weather? Oh. It's, a, it's a little bit bleak. <laughs> it's a little bit. Do something else this weekend. Go, go I don't know, tie, tie some knots, buy some fishing tackle, check you your boats. Go to Gildan and try for a cold or something or the Murray. Or... Go to your mate's first birthday for his son, you know. Get some uh, brownie points up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, I that's love that little boy. He's good. He is very cute. Yeah. So basically, Joe Bun said that the fishing weather is no good for offshore. Make use of this time so that when the weather does come good, you can be all over it. That yeah, is my, su- my summing up of Joe's report there. Get your gear ready. But look, Monday looks sensational if you've got a 
Um, if you've got a day up your sleeve Monday, a lot of people will be going back to work. I reckon it could be quite a quiet day on the water. You so, can you, have... so you've got to wait for people to go back to work? And that's when you roll, basically? Yeah. Well, yeah. Very Happens. good. Happens. Um, so there you go. The weather's been quite good in Tassie too because mate Jonah has been out on the shelf multiple times. He's linged up there. Look at those big horrible oh, things. Pink ling. Look at that. Big barrel blue eye. I caught one of them when and we were wine fishing. Sent, some reason he sent me his onions that he's grown in the no, garden. That, that's garlic. That's garlic. Right, oh, mate. garlic. I thought you were a food connoisseur. Oh, who knows? Onion garlic. And, oh, yes. And Have you this heard is this a story? story, guys, because oh, this his, his fishing companion, he, he's been on his boats for 12 years or so, over a decade, and never had this happen. That's little Martha. Yes, it is. Who's, I think, a Roddy cross for something small. Yep. Um, I think it's like a Kelpie or something. I don't know. Something, some, some kind of cattle dog. But um, yeah, what a, what actually happened is they went um, bait fishing and for like salmon and squid and whatever, and they were pulling in the the hooks, and it got tangled around the back of the boat or something. They ripped in one set of hooks and still had a bait on it, and the dog had it in its mouth, and they didn't know they were still trying to unt- untangle it. Oh. And then they go, oh, where's the baited hook gone? And they've looked and it's in the dog's mouth and there's this line hanging out of its throat. And they've literally had to rush to the vet and the vet was quite busy that night. It was by, coming up. by the way, Jonah was quite pleased. He got to go full speed with his new motor and was doing motor stats on the way in while yes. his dog was being rushed to the vet. As a scientist <laughs> does. Yep. He checks the stats. Yep. Batman's a scientist. <laughs> he is. Absolutely. <laughs> Good addition, Joe. Thanks. And um, literally they got to the vet and they were in the waiting room for an hour or so and the dog spat the hook out whole. Um, it was a miracle basically and wow. they didn't require any surgery. And So what did the vet charge? Nothing because it was in the waiting room. <laughs> oh, um, that's in the yeah, waiting room. Thank yeah. goodness. So they didn't have to see the vet whatsoever and they walked away and, yeah, they'll be thinking twice about baited hooks on the deck. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't think they... Did it on purpose. I think these things just happen. Yeah, but yep. Uh, yeah, we've got a we've we've had a really good response tonight with a few questions being sent in. Oh, you're showing a few photos. Yeah, oh, just showing Jonah. He, oh, look at this! He's, he's a bloody fisherman basket. He's look a meat that. harvesting machine. He's got crays. He's got arrow squids. He's got black lip abalone. He's the, loving. The, they're life. allowed to use cray pots. pots in, yeah, um, but as you can see, he likes the snorkel method. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, he jumps in and he, he grabs them like a he, real man. He's a purist <laughs> when it comes to uh, diving. He goes all cray fishing should be free hold breath. Um, that's it. Oh, that's right to say there when they're literally crawling around <laughs> yeah. like sea lice oh, when he's, everywhere. When you're smashing into a lobster roll, I don't think they'd give a shit if you held your breath or not. <laughs> like, let's be honest. No, it's it's more it's more Joe's offended. For, yeah, <laughs> we're getting a bit soft here, guys. Like, just oh, did freaking, you when you, just dropped, get, get when you dropped your GoPro off the pillars? Did you have to get a scuba diver to get it for you? Or no, you, I got it myself. Okay, no, I had to get. I got a snorkel and mask. How deep was it? <laughs> Two meters. Okay. Were your uh, lady friends impressed or ashamed? <laughs> no, they had no idea that the camera had snapped off and went in the water. <laughs> yeah, he dropped him off to the se- secluded beach, the nude beach around the corner, and he said, you guys get get, get your gear off and I'll get my gear back. No, they, like the- they were off frolicking with other gentlemen by that stage, I'd say. You reckon? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Joey, don't tell me you got stood up nah. by the own women. Nah, it's all good. <laughs> Joe's Joe response tells me that's exactly accurate. Yeah, yeah something like that. Um. We've had a good response to the questions tonight, boys. Yeah, uh, what do we got? Yeah, we'll run through. Let, let's let's hit the button though. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Adrian's panicking, looking for the intro. No, I'm not. Oh. Hit, hit me with, with your questions. questions. Why, Why don't you hit, hit us with, with your questions? questions? Hit me with, with your questions. questions. Far away. away. Oh, wow. How'd you rate yourself there, Joe? <laughs> yeah, it's getting better every week. It's, it's <laughs> aging nicely. Yeah. Um, Shane Idol, here we go. Yeah. What What have we got? Who's asking a question? Well, Lee, Lee's Chill has asked me for some whiting tips. Uh, I'll, I'll do a couple of quickies. Yeah. A couple of quickies, Joe. A lot of burly. <laughs> oh, yeah. We had dual burly pots. Dual. So you just pretend you're fishing for live bait. Yakas and stuff. Just barely, barely up a frenzy and they'll come in, right? So dual, dual burly pots if you can. Uh, move 
frequently to put yourself on the fish. And we are, we're still, jury is out for me and Joe. We're trying to work out what the best hook is. But personally, I'm returning to my old school favorite of the standard circle hook. I wasn't happy with the long shanks. The one, the one I circle. Yep. Yeah, the, the, the long shanks are good. I'd look, we had circles on board. The only thing I don't like about circles, uh, and this will just depend if those this particular fish is present while you're anchored, is uh, the old leather jacket. The old leather jacket gets a circle hook down or it'll just uh, bite you clean off. That's the only thing, uh, yeah. They're going to bite any hook clean off, I think. No, but like, yeah, like, you get a leather jacket on a long shank hook, you're not going to lose your whole kit. By the way, I had a first capture on that trip. I caught a... I heard you got a blue eye Travella. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I think they might be related. It they was are, a, they're the same family. Yeah. yeah. Much easier though. Yeah. Snotty Travella. Never caught one before. Uh, well, and, no size limit, so it doesn't matter what. Uh, no, size I actually are. called Jonah to check. Oh, you I was called trying to a scientist. Work. I couldn't find a size limit. He goes, "You're all good. There's no size limit." Yeah. I'm like, here we go. Because they're not so common. <laughs> anyway, um, really good eating. Did you eat him? I did, and it was delicious, and it fought good too. So, yeah, you would highly recommend. Hey, just go back to the burly situation from that question. Um, so barrel on, bluefin. Yeah. <laughs> Dave oh, had no. some... Um, Jonah, <laughs> if you're listening, Dave caught a bluefin <laughs> and burlied to... it up. No, it was off cuts. But... Oh, he burlied a bluefin up just so he could go whiting fishing, guys. Well, is that on or not? It was well, off cuts, everyone. I, I had... Um, <laughs> so, look, burley for whiting can get really, really expensive. So, look, my dad, the uh, resourceful man he, he is, he just bought a 20-kilo bag of uh, chook pellets and he just flavors them with uh, tuna oil. And that's what he uses for, for his um, burley. And he actually gave me some pre-frozen burley socks with weights already in it. So, so he uses his old socks and shoves the pellets in there? No, Joe? it's like, it's like uh, these, these, uh, these uh, cheaper onion. Uh, they're Rigmaster burley, burley uh, baskets. Like, yeah, it's like a caterpillar and it comes out to three things and there's a few weights in that. And he's got the tuna oil and chicken pellet. Um, mixture and he has them frozen with the rope already attached in the in the freezer. Incredible! And you just um, whack them overboard. But then Dave had his um, burly pot going with. Uh, um, mind you, we've got these burly pots weighted, so they're actually sitting on the sea floor, attracting uh, fish. And uh, Dave's got his uh, belly flaps of uh, bluefin that he was hucking oh, up. Shit. And um, so we had two, two pots, but all the whiting bites were happening on Dave's side of the boat. And, look, I've got a theory. I guess the current is going a certain way, taking the taking I think the it was the, the, the bluefin belly flaps. I've That's what it. he thinks. I've got a theory. They say match the hatch. Now, these whiting naturally feed on 100 kilo bluefin, I think in my so, opinion. Yeah. <laughs> They swim along, nipping at them. Yeah, absolutely. so they've gone. You know, natural food source. We're going to go there. Bang on. That's my tips. So yeah, uh, but burly for for whiting um, in Western Port's good. There was another question as well that came through, and uh, someone wants to know what's a go with Joey's love adventure. <laughs> That's the oh, question. Cool. You got to answer it. Oh well, no, I had um, no, I had a couple of uh, there was this particular girl that I was uh, keen on. We we took um. Yeah, we took a nice little tour up and down the peninsula, her and her girlfriend. and uh, Her and her girlfriend. Yeah, her and her girlfriend. And, yeah, we did some nice uh, sightseeing and beach jumping and snorkeling and had a, um, yeah, a couple of drinks and had some nice uh, lat- Latino music happening on the boat. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, she's sadly moving to Sydney. So that's finished there. So Her yeah. loss, Joe. Just, you know what, you call it a summer romance, Joey, and you move on. Well, that, that's it. That, that's where it ends. She moves to Sydney next week. So it's best you be sing, sing, single for when you start uh, the reality love TV show that we've got you signed up for. Anyway. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm waiting for works. Married at First Sight to call me up. So yeah. Well, well they'll call actually, you up. <laughs> actually, we signed you up for the Bachelors. Like it, it's a plural. Oh, <laughs> yeah. is it really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm not going into a beachside mansion with a whole bunch of meatheads again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Well, it's only meatheads. Oh, shit. <laughs> no, Joe wouldn't be going to that. No, he hasn't got the joke yet. No. Has <laughs> Western Port, I'm just straightening this up here, from Jason D, has Western Port or Port Phillip started to slow on the reds? What's your key to finding fish during spawning? I think they're actually going really good, but no one's really fishing for them. Um, and, you know, this time of year you go to the deep water where it's a bit cooler. Plenty yep. of people catching snapper at the at the moment. 
in um, Port Phillip. If you just know where to look, um, I've seen a lot. I look, I follow Reedy's rigs on. Um, he got some today, Facebook. I think. There's a, you know, he's catching them himself. He's interviewing a lot of uh, anglers that are they're getting snapper at the moment, so they are still there. He's a real relentless snapper fishing machine, that man. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that, now, I, I would say uh, fish deep, um, maybe softer pilchard baits. Although Western Port, you'll still get them, um, although in lower numbers, uh, in the regular spots. I find nighttime good after Christmas. Mm. Um, that water's a little bit cooler. Well, yeah, look, just a recap on my report. Um, first first light um, on snapper snatches um, and barely the, the crap out of a broken ground area. Um, yeah, Mount Martha, 18 and a half metres. Done. Easy. Done deal. That's, yeah. that's his tips. There you go, everyone. Has anyone, Brody Connolly, eaten a Chinook salmon deciding whether to take one home? Oh, he's got a live decision going on. Well, I actually think um, they wouldn't stock chin hook salmon if they didn't taste good, would they? No. So they've got to taste quite good uh, if they're going to stock them in. All like, the salmon taste Are they in trout delicious. farms? Don't they put chin hooks? Yeah, yeah. They, they they release them in these um, lakes and man-made lakes and whatever. Yeah. And they're, you know, a catch take home. Species, I know so. we've mentioned it a few times on the podcast, but Dave, you actually, one of your childhood jobs was working at a trout farm, wasn't it? Yeah, they didn't have chinooks. <laughs> well, I'm led to believe How dare that. They? It's probably rainbow trout, was it? Yeah, it's just rainbows yeah. uh, and browns. Oh, and browns, okay. I'm led to believe that of the salmon, the, Adla- uh, the uh, Atlantic salmon are the best eating ones, and then chinook are quite good as well. What about the king salmon? They look impressive. I don't yeah, think the they're American as good king to eat. Oh, they're not, but they look impressive. Um, but I think when you catch them in the wild there, it depends a lot on their spawning mode, whether they're spawned or not. Because pretty yeah. much they spawn they and then they just lose all um, <laughs> condition and die. Hey, Dave, what was your job when you used to work at the trout farm? I, um, well, I, I did a bit of everything. <laughs> he was the chook pellet boy. No, well, I uh, guided the anglers onto their dream fish. <laughs> <laughs> he, was a, he was a trout farm guide. Can you believe it? It's not all guys? glory, Joe. You gotta go gut all those guys, fish for him, fill yeah, out all the fish. You gotta go take the guts down to the uh the garden bed and they, they use the guts to grow yeah. um, veg and stuff for the cafe, which is actually quite sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. Um and then you take all the guts down there and chuck lime over it to get it to break down and yeah, she's not all so, she's not all rainbows and skittles. If you want to catch a trout at a trout farm, Dave is your guide. Yes, yeah, so, uh, now. I'm actually opening up some guided trout farm tours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I great. Take you there and get you onto the big dogs, but yeah. you got to pay for the fish. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's like yeah, but like can you them. imagine what the price is now? Because yeah. it's quite inflated the uh, overall price of living. Um, it's probably like a seventy dollar fish for a kilo fish or something. Yeah, yeah it's just but... like that scene from Coming to America at the barbershop cuts his head. That'll be three hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Catch like a little that. trout. That'll be three hundred and fifty dollars. I don't know the reference, but I'm sure it's funny. Yeah. I have seen the it, show. It, but, it, yeah. Yeah, no. uh, uh Jacob, your mate Jacob Snapper Abood, he's your biggest fan, Joe, he wants to know about your love oh. adventure, but we we're have probably, covered we it. We have we're covered it. it, but I just wanted Jacob to know that we've we've seen. Yeah, we message. literally just asked that question from oh, Jacob. Like, you moved, read it. Oh, you've gone out of order, Adrian. You always stuff me up. She's moving to Sydney. It's finished. Yep. Favorite ways to eat tuna, boys. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, Creamy tuna pasta cabinet. Yeah, that's pretty good. That is pretty good. Um, Wham. You know, even just panko crumb is pretty good as well for tuna. Have you tried that? Like normal no. fillets? No. It's but pretty good. I'll tell you what, we were getting a bit bored the other day. We had a bit of tuna. Yeah. Did you have any? No. No. I haven't caught a tuna. Oh, sorry. For it's caught. been a long time since I caught a tuna. Oh. Um, and we, Maddie looked up a recipe and it was wasabi tuna burgers. Oh, yeah. That sounds beautiful. My God, was that delicious. But yeah. what what uh, bread did you source for the burger? It was just your, it was just your standard white toasted bun. That's just what we had. Okay, sure, yeah. Um, but it was the actual Joey's burger. Joey's disappointed that it wasn't a sugar brioche bun. Or no, something. no, no, that's all right. No, I'm just I was just out of curiosity. Like, yeah, it was the burger patty that was the most delicious part of it. Wait, so have you shredded up the tuna like a mince, very finely diced, and then um, spring onion, um, sesame seed, chili, uh, wasabi. And salt, pepper, and form them into the patties. 
And then oh, that sounds delicious. Oh, really good. And then I on my burger did QP. Oh, also QP mayo in the mix. Oh, perfect. I did QP mayo on the burger, pickled ginger, a little bit Ooh. extra wasabi, and that was all. That and, sounds delicious. Well, oh, and, Matt, and actually, Matt is saying coriander. garlic and ginger as well. Yeah, well, she cooked them. I'm just taking the yeah. glory. Uh, <laughs> coriander as well on top. Fresh coriander. That's what I. Oh, you can shove that up your ass. <laughs> you're one of those people. Oh my goodness, Joe! You're you're from Mauritius. Coriander is a big dish in these in these dishes. Look, Mauritian it, dishes. If it's cooked, I'll deal with it. Joey, it's ma- part of the flavor. It all mixes and marinates uh, together. Can I ask, Joe? It's like a dirty weed. Does it taste like soap to you? Because apparently, to, to some people, it tastes like soap. No, it tastes just like a dirty weed. What? You idiot! Get out. So, so when, so did you butter the rolls, Dave? Shut up. Well, okay. Shane wants to know. No, they weren't buttered. He, that scarred him for life when he made you those lobster rolls. Why did it scar him? I'm the one that went hungry when he, Joe ate my roll. He, he, went and, he went and dived for these crayfish and he goes, you know what, I'm going to spoil the boys here. I'm going to make some lobster rolls. And Dave declined him because it had butter on the roll. And to a chef, when someone doesn't eat your food, it really like, well, what have I done wrong here? Yeah. Well, I've done it to done how it should wrong, taste. <laughs> Uh, actually, it kind of came up the other day when me and Joe went with Simon and there was butter oh, on every roll. Yes. I said, Simon, you're supposed to be a big fan of the podcast. You should know this. <laughs> and he was ashamed and he blamed his wife. <laughs> meanwhile, hey, hey, meanwhile, she's probably listening. She listens too. Yeah. So. Meanwhile, I'm very sorry, Simon's wife, that I didn't eat your roll. But m- Meanwhile, I was just having the time of my life with these turkey and cranberry and lettuce fresh rolls. Creme fresh. Mm. Jamie has just written kings with exclamation marks. So he's, he's hyped for the kingfish season. Well, there was one caught off Seal Rock today. It's on the reports of fishing online. And That's it was caught it. on a live car light. That's it. So Joey's going. That's he's, it. He's Commence the boat stampede to he's, Seal Rocks. Yep, exactly. And I can imagine it'll be quite busy from now on. Joe? Joey's actually gone. He's left the Jay, studio. Back? I was excited. <laughs> Fishing goals for 2023, trips away, species that we're keen to target. I want to go marlin fishing. You, Definitely. You, Joey loves marlin fishing. I want to go marlin fishing with both of you guys. We'll have the time of our life. Let's book it in. Well, it'll probably be March for me. <laughs> March is a good time. End of yeah. Feb, March. That's my favorite yeah. time. There, apparently, there's a lot of marlin getting caught off Sydney and, and north of there at the there's moment. A, there's a strong easterly wind that's happened over the last week, so it's not looking ideal on the south coast. No, but apparently like yesterday, boats were getting multiple, multiple shots at Marlin off oh, Sydney, Sydney. Okay, that's which good. Which generally isn't the best Marlin fishery around, so that's a good sign. But it does hold there every now and then. This, mm. this window may only last a week and then it'll push south because, yeah, normally that hot water and it eddies down off um, Eden or Burmy and that's where you get the good bite. Good good friend of mine, Rob Prince, is up in Naruma at the minute and, yeah, he was saying it's been pretty quiet um, on the old Marlin at the moment. So, yeah, and he's quite a good Marlin fisherman. Okay. He's so, got to go north. J- just quickly, guys, Simon's asked his wife uh, what, um, <laughs> that there was no butter on any rolls whatsoever. That's his wife just told him. Oh, so I missed out. Yeah. Damn so, it, Joseph. What so there was just a miscommunication. Did you did you like uh did you scare Simon into going, is there butter on this? And he's like, mm, yes. He said there was. Okay. I'm shattered because they sounded gourmet. They were. They were lovely. I had two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, my fish <laughs> my fishing goals were uh I want to catch a swordfish again. Yeah. I haven't put any effort in for a while and I need to. Um, Just as long as we've got a creaky pergola to winch one up onto. Uh, we probably will we'll try and release it if we can, but you know, okay. not always possible. And I just want to do some um, sort of camping and exploratory trips. That's probably one of the main nice. things that I'm really into these days is just exploring and the whole adventure oh, that is. So, yeah, hopefully some of them. All sounds good. Just got to get the time to do it. Yeah. Joey? No, oh, he said he wants to do marlin. I want a marlin. There you go. What kind I've, of marlin I've, do you want? Um, so I came close to catching a marlin, I think it was 2015, 2016. And you've stopped off the, ever since. Off the lake's entrance oil rigs. Um, I was on board with uh, Dave. She was a magnificent bite, that one too. Yeah, skip baiting and it just sheared straight through the leader. I was on it for about three minutes and <laughs> since then. In three minutes it sheared through the leader. Yeah. Picture this. Yeah. We're trolling between the 
giant oil rigs there, the central block platform. We're passing Cobia rig yeah. on our eastern side. And Joe, with his blurry eyes, says, Marlin. <laughs> I'm like, whatever. His Joe. blurry eyes. I'm like, no, whatever. Pre, pre-laser eyes. Pre, pre, pre-laser pre eyes. Yeah. I was like, yeah, as if. Look up. There's a stripe, a big stripe lit up on the skip bait. And I'm like, here we go. So it comes up on the skip bait. And you know what I did? I pulled it out the rigger clip and I fed it back to it. And yeah. bang, she was on. Very good. And that was the highlight. No, then when greyhounding off, we only had 200 pound leader, which um, now, from now on when I skip bait, I go a lot heavier because the leader's out of the it's water even, anyway. Yeah, it's not even in water. Yeah, I'm an idiot. I get it. Um, and we had it on for a little while. It was going nuts. And what happened was we had a, a pressure break or what happened, like what happens is the mono goes through the corner of the marlins. Well, mouth. when they're, when they're thrashing like this, their bill's rubbing against it too, and it's just yeah, it was a their pretty, lips, their bill. It's oh, all abrasive. It was more your clean break though, so oh, yeah. pressure break the, where it's pincered in the corner of the jaw. Yeah, I've got the video of that. We'll get that up on the Instagram. Yeah, there you go. We will, Joe. We'll yeah. put that up. Have you said your goals yet, Adrian? No, um, I think tag at one hundred. Well, yeah, no one's really done that yet, and I'd love to do that. Um, yeah, imagine if someone actually does tag at one hundred. I'm already up to impressive. three. No, you haven't tagged any. You, you tagged on. Yeah. It's not impossible. Well, nah, a four, re- on a four twenty renegade. No, it isn't. Like, <laughs> you, okay, like no, no, let, Joe, no let, you've got a four twenty. I want to see you catch it. No, your boat's way more sea able than mine. <laughs> but no, let no, just hang on a second, like. On your best um, tuna trips, yeah. like what was the best one single session I reckon you had? Me and Dave on poppers in May or June or whatever at the east, we must have got between twenty or thirty that that That's afternoon. What I mean, it only takes like, um, three or four t- trips yeah. like that, think, and then you're uh, done. I did. Uh, me and Winger did twenty nine in half a day. Yeah, a year or so ago off Barwon. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's it's definitely not impossible, but. When you got um, things in the way in your personal life, it makes it a bit harder. But no, I understand. But you know, if you're out fishing every day, oh, easy peasy. Um, yeah. yeah. But perhaps it could happen. Um, we'll see what happens. But you know, right. one of the biggest things I really want to do, and I keep putting it back to do other things like tuna fishing. I still want to go get myself a meter cod. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, and I'd love to do that before winter this year. So nice. So no, know. See what happens. Um, and what does it take to go and get a meter cod? <laughs> you could go to Eildon not... instead of go or, or the Murray and and instead of going tuna fishing. You that's need what a it takes. Scope, let's be honest. Yeah, or or you just randomly cast budgies and rats at the at the trees and just hope. Mm. Good guys. Um, right, yeah, because right. Pinter actually got a, a meter thirty or something. He did. Fish. Thomas, um, Captain Thomas. Yeah, out of um. Was it on the Murray? Uh, no, he's up at um, Yarrawonga. Yes, up there. Yeah, on, so um, made a thirty-one. Mawala. Yeah, Lake Mawala. Um, yeah, giant fish. That's huge. One thirty-one. Yeah. Um, good on him. Yeah. So we'll there's to get some Captain fish Tomo around. on the podcast again this year. He was yep. a great addition last time. Yeah. Um, good, good answers, boys. Party Pete wants to know: Can the D's win this year? Yeah, unlikely. They, well, um, we can. We can. Very unlikely, I'd say. Had a mate at work. Uh, they put on a Carlton to win the flag. Right. Already? Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah okay. I think he had good odds on, on that. So, yeah. I think it yeah, would that, be there's good There's a reason odds. for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why? We've discussed this already. Nath McDermott wants to know why the summer tuna is so damn fussy because they're jerks. Yeah, basically they're jerks. Uh, wind, a lot of people no asking wind. about tuna. What bay would you target snapper during this time of year and why? We kind of went through that, didn't we? Yeah, I think yeah. we all kind of agree. Port Phillip, yeah, um, yeah. at the moment. Offshore, or, or, offshore gives you a good option too. I've seen yes. off the Port Ferry and uh, Portland reports. There's um, some good snapper getting jigged up offshore. Yep, that's true. And even uh, Memphis got one offshore just the other yeah. day. And While he was um, gummy fishing and mako fishing. I'd probably actually be going to Port Welshwell or Lakes Entrance this okay. time of year, catching a real big dog. They're still around. Yep. Um. Pete so, Ferguson's still floating out there, is he? He probably is. And to finish off on the questions, Adrian's boat. Joel W wants an update. What's happening with it? Well, if you follow Steve's custom welding, you'll see my boat's almost finished. No, that's his boat. <laughs> um, it, it's actually looking really amazing. So he's finishing his boat first and then he'll start mine. So maybe he'll start it 
the end of this month or February. Um, the motor's due to be fitted off by JV Marine in late March, I think. So possible April could be on the water. Awesome. All depends if everything goes to plan. Yeah. And, I, and there'll be a 420 Renegade for sale, although someone's already... Yeah, I'll, pro- I'll probably have to put it up for sale before that, <laughs> before mm. March, but yeah, we'll see. Because I'll have to fund things, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> That's fair enough. Well, thanks so much for all the questions, everyone. That was one of the best uh, question turnouts we've had in some time. So uh, good on you all. Thanks for listening. It's been a long podcast tonight, but, you know, we have a lot to catch up on. It's been a few weeks. We'll be back with uh, regular shows as much as we can. Hey, and just quickly, guys, if you see the apparel that we're wearing, we've still got a few T-shirts and hoodies for sale. So Show them the back, Joey. So if you want, just give us a message and, yeah. I We've just, got a few available I and just, we'll let you know. The only reason why I didn't put mine on tonight because I wanted to be an individual. <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't want to wear That's the true. army green. Um, yeah, so we got a few of them for sale, t- tees and hoodies. So send us a message on Instagram or in the comments and we'll get back to you. And, and they're, they're, very, they're really comfortable. They really are. They're an AS color hoodie blank, which are, in my opinion, the best. Yeah. And uh, damn comfortable, damn warm. And we've got the shirts there as well for this summer period. Even I bought one. <laughs> Absolutely, he did. <laughs> Anyway, thanks, guys. G'day, you bloody legends. Thanks for listening to and watching Wind Against Tide once again. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You'd be doing us a massive favor. Thanks, guys, and see you next week. Man, I hate butter.